Good morning and uh, welcome to day two of the APAC Offshore Wind and Green Hydrogen Summit. Today we are going to kick off with a CEO panel to talk about uh, the, what we've learnt so far in the Australian offshore wind market and in particular take a bit of a deep dive into the Gippsland area and look at some of the uh, ideas around regional collaboration and how we're going to attract some supply chain into Victoria and Australia and uh, how that's going to be collaborative with the rest of the world. Before we get into today's session, uh, I would like to just run through a few of the housekeeping matters. Not everyone was here. We've got a few new joiners that weren't here yesterday. So
sadly in our case, decade plus process to get through. So I think with everyone coming in at the moment, I think everyone's gung-ho around clean energy, renewables, carbon emissions. I think the main thing that people are starting to really quickly learn, a lot of it's around the stakeholder journey, um, how you interact with people. It's not solely about government objectives, it's about bringing regional development and regional communities along on the journey as well. So I think that's the great sort of head start that Australia's had for, for quite a while. Very different to a number of newer countries, particularly in Asia Pacific, where it's probably a little bit more government driven because there are real challenges about running to come from the third or second world to the first world. I mean, a need to really put money out there and economically drive things from a very central level. You know, we've got a really good opportunity here in Australia in that our history and legacy has been based on doing a lot of that interpersonal skill work. I mean, it's been the same around a number of the other regions as well. I mean, whilst Gippsland has 11 years of history, um, which gives it a massive head start, it's got a much bigger region than some of the other states. The other states are also progressing really well as well. You know, we look at New South Wales, there have been uh, developers up there for three and a half years. Western Australia is the same, Northern Tasmania is the same. Western Victoria around about four years as well. So when you do come to Australia and we're looking at developing these projects, it goes far beyond the headline bullet points that are out there in the newspaper articles. Um, I think a lot of people have misconceptions that it is purely around renewable energy. What we're really doing, and look, the narrative we've sought to create in Australia is they're actually building nationally significant infrastructure projects in a marine environment. That's what it's about. And it takes a totally different mindset to what's been done and dealt with previously. I think a lot of people really get surprised that when they see the main players come in, they are invariably from an offshore oil and gas background, which is realistically where the skill sets actually lie. So that's why we, when we look at, you know, Gippsland in particular, we've got 27 applicants, um, we've put in 37 applications, which I think is a testament to the strength of the region and the support for the projects. But I think also the recognition of the key operators and funds that have done this around the world, bringing their expertise out here to Australia. And it really is critical. I think if we stand back and look at what we've done over the nation now, and believe me, we are still very much on the starting blocks. We've got a long, long way to go but we've sort of achieved half the challenge and that's actually getting the key players who will make this happen here actively in Australia. You know, and you know, the panel will go through it um, in a few minutes time, but you know, we've actually got people here based in offices working on this. This is not just a desktop process from Europe. We've got people here, not only traveling to conferences, but actually setting up teams. Um, I think that's probably, not that I'm responsible for it, but I think that's one of the great areas of pride I really take from, seven or eight years ago when it was just three guys self-funding trying to get things going, the fact that there are probably already about 100 permanent jobs already within companies progressing offshore wind, as well as all the consultants um, and other parties involved actually making a living out of offshore wind. When we go forward, even if we're looking at Victoria and we're looking at state goals, if we're looking at nine gigawatts of projects by 2040, um, assume you've got at least five licenses or so, which will get released very soon. I've got no more information than, than anybody else. Um, you look at the amount of jobs and the size of the industry that's going to be created for a place like Victoria, which has been talking and actively moving towards transition for quite a while now. It's setting, you know, Victoria in particular up for decades and decades of success in new industry. When we look at the coal industry here in Victoria, Brown Coal and the Trove Valley, it's a hundred year old industry. Obviously offshore wind and whatever flows from that, whether it's green hydrogen, obviously a lot of new transmission plays, batteries and the like we're looking at what should really be a 50 to 100 year industry. So when we look at the amount of time we've spent so far, 11 years, it's probably appropriate, whilst it's been bloody frustrating, that we've spent that time to at least get that, those foundations right. Um, and I think we're gonna see that around the rest of Australia. I think the great thing about the diversity of the Australian states are there are very different reasons in each state why you'll, why you'll do projects. Um, in Victoria, obviously 27 applicants, looking mainly at um, fixed foundations. New South Wales will be very much a floating foundation state for a variety of reasons. Uh, obviously the continental shelf falls away very quickly. Um, it's a lot more heavily residentialized on the New South Wales coast. Um, and as a Victorian, I've got to say, the New South Wales coast is a lot prettier than in Victoria. So we have to actually preserve some of those vistas. That's true. Um, you know, we move across to Western Australia. Um, I've always been a big advocate for Western Australia in terms of the, the execution prowess that actually exists in WA. When you look at the large offshore oil and gas companies that have been there for 40 years plus, mining for even longer, 
a lot of the capability in the key um, installation companies in particular are based in the West. Um, so I know it's obvious to a lot of people, but I don't think we should be overlooking Western Australia, particularly as a key sort of labor and skill set um, basis. I mean, obviously Shell, Derrick and, and, and other companies in offshore oil and gas know this, but I don't think when we look at states, we should just be thinking about wind resource and opportunity for energy. I think, um, not that I'm encouraging everyone to go to WA, but there are a lot of key players over there that really need to be brought into the industry on the East Coast. Um, and it goes beyond just the, the tangible side of things, certainly on, on approvals and know-how of just going through those processes and operating in a marine um, environment. You know, that's really what the industry is about. When we all go through the CapEx spend and you know, the jobs and capability you need, a lot of it is marine based and we don't have a lot of it on the East Coast, particularly in New South Wales. So we really need to bear in mind that, yes, of course, it's gonna be a global effort to get things going in Australia, but we need to look at what we've got here in Australia. Um, I don't know, Stu will touch on it later, but also New Zealand is a developing market as well that we can't overlook um, when we're looking at Australian offshore wind. Look, they're going through some important developments over there. Minister Woods has been really good in releasing a few consultation papers, looking at a regulatory framework to be introduced next year. They've got elections in two months' time, which could go either way, but I think the New Zealand um, situation has been heavily influenced by what's going on in Australia. And I think when we do look at what we're trying to get up in Australia, we need to bear in mind New Zealand, um, particularly for a look at a lot of investors um, coming out here. It's a long way to come. New Zealand's a much smaller market to look electricity-wise. It's just less than the Victorian um, demand. So it's very small, but incredible winds. They've got unusual topography, which means they can only build out so much onshore wind. They don't have, unlike Australia, this crazy green versus black debate, which has thankfully died really the last 12 months. They've been at 95% renewables with hydro and geothermal for a long, long time. So New Zealand really is a market that needs to be considered within the whole context of what we're doing uh, here in Australia. But I don't want to steal too much thunder from, from the panel, but I mean, things that I think everyone needs to focus now that everyone's got their PowerPoints out of the way the last two years or so, so everybody knows where everyone's generally doing things, we've really got to start looking at how we actually execute these projects. Um, everyone talks supply chain, advanced manufacturing, but I think the reality for a lot of people, they're just throwaway lines. We've actually got to start spending a lot more time actually looking at how we develop workforces and bring through people in training. Um, Star of the South, um, Aaron released a great guide last year on, on jobs. I think in Australia, we've actually got to try and bring back that manufacturing mentality. We lost it a while ago, we don't have car manufacturers. We regenerate defence manufacturing as much as we can, but invariably it's international operators coming in as the lead contractor. We've got to get really serious about how, how we're going to build these projects. You know, when we're looking, again, just Victoria, nine gigawatts of projects. You know, depending on what sort of turbines, whether they're 18 or 22 megawatts or whatever we're allowed to build at the time they're built, you're looking at hundreds and hundreds of turbines. Now, of course, things aren't all going to get built here in Australia. I think we're obviously working at realistically well under 50% local content for a good while, but there's going to be massive parts of work, whether it's componentry, assembly or the like, that we actually have to get moving on to get Australia going again in those right directions. We're, we're, we're complaining a lot in this country around prices of electricity. It's actually very good globally, but if we don't start self-generating here, we are going to be a net importer of everything. Um, so we actually want to be a lot more self-sustainable, build security in Australia. We've got to spend a lot more time in actually developing pathways. Um, and personally, uh, look, and people have done around the world, I think that's the most pleasurable part of what we're doing. For me, I'm not an engineer by background. Sadly, I was a lawyer. Years ago, I'm trying to pass myself off as a filmmaker now. Um, the most pleasure I get is actually from people being, you know, satisfied and glad to see you come into their community, create jobs. We've all got numerous stories. I remember when we went uh, to Yarram about five years ago, they had to stop their cricket team for the first time in 100 years, a year prior, which was devastating for the town. You know, we did a lot of presentations at the high school, at Yarram High School. Their main concern was that from kids from year 10 to year 12, they only had two prospects, be unemployed or go to Melbourne. So what we're starting to see now, even in the early stages of what we're doing, is creating hope and optimism for communities. Uh, and personally, I think everyone's the same. You know, that's what you get real joy in doing these projects from. It's not about sitting there looking at balance sheets. They don't look very favorable now with all the numbers, so it's best not to look at numbers too much. But what you really get pleasure from is actually going to a local community opening something new, creating some sort of partnership with a university, 
but really showing that there's a path forward from everyone. And you can visibly see it in the eyes of people to sort of see hope and opportunity. Um, and I think that's the great thing we've got here in Australia. I think we've finally got through the political divide about what's right and what's wrong, what are fair income Aussie jobs and what people are interested in. I think we're actually starting to listen to a little bit of reason now. So thank you to Chris if you're in the room. I think the last 12 months has actually made you feel prouder to be an Australian. We sort of certainly see it now. I think we're actually listening to our kids a lot more. I think that's one of the things that's coming through my film as well. Um, about how we're actually looking at preserving and conserving the planet for as long as we can. It's no longer a sort of died in the wool, hard on the sleeve, emotional, save the planet. It's more just a realism now. Um, and with that realism, it has to come a realism about how we actually execute and get things going. So having dealt a little bit with, with the past, I think you know, what we've got here in Australia is, is a lot of promise. Um, I don't ever like to temper too many things with realism, but we do need to get cracking on things. Um, Obviously, look at my baby, the Star of the South. Look, we're still many years away from putting turbines in the water. Um, and I think everybody releases something new. Journalists get happy at times to put things out there about things happening sooner rather than later. We just need to temper that a little bit. You know, we need you know, a couple of real immediate actions to happen. We need licenses to be issued as soon as they can. Um, and for me, realistically, it's as many as possible. We've got all the lead operators and funds here who are well and truly used to spending money, particularly in that DevEx period. Um, if you're looking at offshore oil and gas, you're going to be spending money, I'll say P10 or P90. You've got to spend a lot of money to keep the next sort of flow through of you know, projects and jobs coming. So I think obviously licenses need to be issued. You know, a lot of companies have already spent a lot of money already just to even get to the starting line before having any guaranteed rights. So I think you sort of get licenses out there, put it back on industry to start spending and generating the opportunities. I mean, the industry's really only got up because it's been industry that's pushed it so much. Look, and thankfully we've had a receptive newer government. Um, to be fair, Angus Taylor was good. He actually put in legislation um, with the Offshore Energy uh, Infrastructure Act. So things have been moving the right way, but what we've really got to start doing is keep accelerating the next few years. I think we can't live in a world of people thinking, wow, Aussies are great, they're nice people, it's a long way, but I like being there because we've got rule of law, so I'll keep spending money here. If we don't actually start doing things, everyone will gradually move on. Um, when you look at a lot of the developing countries, whilst they're hard, um, and I think Mark Laybourne's still here, you know, he's working with 23 developing nations to look at offshore wind. And they've all got varying reasons for it. They'll all have the word we can't mention here in Australia, which is subsidies. So they'll all have economic incentives to get out there and try and attract capital. So I think we've done half the job here in Australia in actually getting people to Australia interested in investing. We need to keep giving investors, funds, and operators reasons to still be here. You know, everyone sadly is still very reportable internally, whether it be to boards or investment committees. I'm no different. You've got to keep things going forward and you've got to show that you're actually tangibly doing things to improve, look, not just your company, but what you're doing on a broader global perspective as well. We can't sit here in isolation thinking we're great people, everyone really likes us generally. We're still a very conservative nation and we really need to lose that and just get accelerating on a number of things. Um, I could obviously talk for a lot longer. I won't do any more plugging of my film, Planet Wind, which comes out on the 22nd of November. <laughs> I'm um, at my conference in Sydney, um, but I'll hand back to Stu and look, obviously, look, thank everyone for coming. Thanks, Stu, for the opportunity. And also, look, thanks, particularly for the next panel. We've got a lot of international travellers, so thanks all for coming out. Thanks, Dave. That's pretty much on time. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, thanks very much, Andy, and um, glad there wasn't too much self-promotion and looking forward to the film Sorry. whenever it comes out on the 22nd of November. <laughs> I'd, now, I'd now like to bring up uh, all of our panellists, and I'll call them up one by one, and uh, actually I'll call them all up together and then we can go through and we'll do the introduction. So. Um, I would like to welcome to the stage Ross Rolfe, the Chairman and C uh, Chief Executive Officer of Iberdrola Australia, Erin Coldham, the Chief Development Officer of Star of the South, Copenhagen Offshore Partners Australia and New Zealand, Derek McKay, Executive General Manager, uh, Offshore Wind and Generation Asset, Shell Energy Australia, Jonathan Cole, CEO of Corio Generation, Raphael Manila, uh, Chief Business Development Officer of Ocean Winds, and Franca Van Leeuw. Uh, CEO Parkwind. 
Can you please make them all welcome? It looks a little bit like an episode of The Bachelor. <laughs> or The Bachelorette. I'm sorry, Aaron. You, we, sorry we don't have more people and more women on the stage at the moment, but uh, let's start that. Yeah. Um, we'll start with a little bit of introduction and getting to know people uh, who's on the stage. So, Francois, maybe if you can tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, also your, your background and a little bit about Parkwind, who are, I think are one of the more astute of, uh, developers we see. Uh, yeah, the mic works. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, François Vanleu, co-CEO of Parkwind. Uh, the, the word co says it, which means that I have a partner in crime uh, managing the company with me, and he's also here, uh, Eric. Uh, we are, I, I would say, still a young company. Uh, we've been created in, uh, back in 2012 with the main focus to develop and build offshore wind farms. Doing so for, I'd say, more than 10 years, we've been developing and building five offshore wind farms now in Europe, and have been very successful in there, and, and let's say have developed a, a very strong team of like 160 professional capable of doing what we tend to say everything in offshore wind, which means that we, can, we are able to capture uh, each and every component in the value chain of, of offshore wind eh, from the early development via uh, the real development, co-managing of construction and operations and maintenance, which is key in having the full control uh, over your project and making sure it will be built, because as, as, as uh, was said in, in the introduction, it's about a lot of money. It's about making sure we deliver uh, within time and budget, but it's also about creating value, sustainable value for let's say, the country we're investing in uh, in the long run. Um, recently, uh, in that exciting journey, we've been uh, acquired by a new shareholder, uh, Jira, uh, and we look forward to it in that sense that it, it should give us uh, even more uh, firepower uh, to grow the company further and make sure that we contribute to what uh, Andy said is, is key uh, going forward. It's no longer about, you know, uh, let's invest a bit in sustainable energy uh, to, to change the energy mix of the future so that we uh, have some new industry growing in, in, in each and every country. It's also about the conviction that we need to do something and change something if we want these future generations to live on, on, on the very beautiful planet we we're living in today. So a long journey uh, for Parkwind in 10 years' time, uh, very successful. A real focus on offshore wind and looking forward to bring all of this expertise to, to Australia. Thanks very much for that. Raphael? Thanks, Stuart. I mean, I have, uh, we have something in common with Parkwind. Uh, I'm, I mean, I'm the Chief Business Development Officer in Ocean Winds. We are also a very young company. We were created uh, in 2020, I mean, in just a couple of weeks before pandemic. And also we have in common with Parkwind that we are a pure player. We only do offshore wind. No? We were created just to you know, develop, build, and operate offshore wind. Nevertheless, we have behind very strong partners, back in us up, uh, EDP and, and Engie. I mean, both companies were you know, developing and, and doing offshore wind for a while. We had the chance to work together in projects in the past. You know, the thing is, you know, a simile that we normally use after you know, dating for years, we decided that we have a good relationship and we decided to get married. And that's, you know, that's the outcome of, of Ocean Winds. And uh, since 2020, you know, the company was created uh, with, a very, you know, with a global ambition to become, uh, I mean, we came maybe a little bit later than others, but we have a, an ambition to be big in the business. And you know, as I said, with a global ambition, not only looking at our origins in Europe, but also you know, to, to America and also to selected geographies here in APAC. And, and I would say that it was not easy at the beginning for us uh, you know, to, to make the decision to come here to Australia because, I mean, uh, it's, you know, it's us. I mean, I'm, I'm from Spain, actually. We have headquartered there. And, and although it might be seen as something stupid in this global world, but, you know, distance is something that, you know, that is also important with making these type of decisions. But, uh, you know, I would say that uh, Australia ticks all the boxes for us. And you know, and and you know, when we make the decision to come here, it's something that is, you know, it's not just uh, an opportunistic move for Islam. No, hopefully we, 
we are successful, but if not, we will continue you know, pushing forward because, I mean, we believe that there's a, that makes sense to do also win here in this country. Yeah, thanks for that. We'll uh, get into the Gippsland in, uh, area in just a sec. Jonathan. Hi, everyone. So I'm Jonathan Cole. I, I guess I'm here in two capacities. One is as the chairman of GWEC, and the other is as the chief executive of Corio Generation, which like the two companies you've just heard of, is a relatively young company and is a company with a single mission in life, which is uh, offshore wind. Uh, before coming to Corio, I was a colleague of Ross at Iberdrola and I was involved in setting up and running Iberdrola's uh, global offshore wind business for many years. And prior to that, like Andy, I was actually a lawyer. Um, so I, I recently celebrated f 5,000 days without doing any lawyering. And, uh, I'll continue to take it one day at a time, but with the support of my family, hopefully I'll never, never find myself back there. Um, so yeah, so, um, so Corio is a, an offshore wind company. We, we, we were born about a, just over a year ago in, in April last year, but actually we, were, we came out of the Macquarie group. Uh, so we've got quite a long heritage in offshore wind, being one of the early movers in sort of kind of financing offshore wind, especially in the UK back in the early days. Uh, we've got about 30 gigawatts of projects quite well spread all over the world in North and South America, a lot going on uh, in, in Europe, in the UK. But we have a lot happening here in the APAC region. We're one of the early movers in Taiwan and South Korea. And then we've been here on the ground in Australia for a few years now developing projects uh, off the, 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 the Gippsland coast. And what's quite cool actually about our business here is quite a lot of the team that we've got here are offshore wind experienced professionals who uh, are actually local people who learned their trade in Europe and now they've got to come back home to Melbourne and, and help set up an industry here, which is uh, you know, uh, quite special, I think, for them. So anyway, looking forward to uh, participating in this panel discussion. Thanks, Jonathan. And, and uh, actually, as a Melbourne boy, I realised I'd been pronouncing choreo uh, or Cario, Cario, no, wrong no. all my life. <laughs> Thank you very much for the correction. We, we, were, we were not named after the town of Corio. No, we're named after the Coriolis effect, in fact. Thanks. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, look, uh, just reflecting on Andy's comment at the start around the 10,000 hours. So as, as Shell, um, and the comment about needs no introduction, I think from a Shell perspective, we've been in Australia for 120 years in offshore infrastructure for 50 years. Uh, people don't realise who aren't in the offshore wind game that we've been in offshore wind for about 20 years. We have a number of uh, operating offshore wind facilities, one in commissioning right now, and a, a nine gigawatt uh, uh, pipeline um, for future developments. So, you know, generally Shell, um, you know, amazing company to work for, a lot of opportunity. Uh, for me personally, I work in the Shell Energy part of the business, so really that's uh, from an Australian perspective, it's roughly 200 terawatt hours of electricity uh, that's sold in Australia in the national electricity market. We sell around 10% of that market, um, so largely focusing on the business side of things. So we've got a very much a customer focus. So while the others uh, so far have been talking about their, their interest as a pure play sort of offshore wind developer, for us it's really that focus on the customer and how do we make sure that from an offshore wind perspective we're keeping on that customer involvement. Uh, personally, um, I saw a video this morning uh, Ned, uh, the camera, cameraman Ned, wherever, wherever you are, Ned, showed a fantastic video that he'd done as part of the um, uh, uh, destruction of the Hazelwood Power Station. And for me personally, uh, I joined the electricity market in Australia. I uh, was 17 years old and the first power station that I worked at was the Wallerawang Power Station in New South Wales. And in, when you're going thinking about full circle, that power station no longer produces electricity. It was a coal-fired power station. And as Shell, we're in the process right now of having a, a project, 300 megawatt uh, large scale battery project built on, on that site, right? So when you think about personal involvement and things that drive you, I mean, it's just a fantastic industry, uh, having people like Shell involved with this opportunity to be a part of that transition and, and hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, getting a feasibility license in Gippsland. So anyway, really happy to be here. Thanks, Derek. Erin. 
Hi, I'm Erin Coldham, and no, I haven't been on The Bachelorette before, just to clear that up, <laughs> um, in case I look familiar. Um, no, I, <laughs> I work for um, Star of the South and more broadly focused on Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners' portfolio of offshore wind in this region across Australia and New Zealand. Um, maybe to just start where Derek finished, because I think that's a, a beautiful way to talk about our involvement and what we're doing in this industry and at Star of the South we have a mission which is to advance Australia's offshore wind industry um, and to leave that legacy of clean energy for future generations. We heard quite a lot about that yesterday and um, it's interesting when I connect with global colleagues there's a very similar theme. I won't reel off every office and market that we're working in because frankly I'll forget some and you know there's some really interesting ones coming up lately, like Estonia and Bangladesh that are in our portfolio. So um, talk to us at the stand if you want to know more about our global footprint. But um, in the context of what we're doing in Australia, as Andy said in the introduction, it really has been about how do we move this industry forward? How do we get the green electrons in from offshore wind and make that step change that we need in this journey that we're on? Um, a few other roles and um, organisations that I'm personally involved in, if we, if we touch on those during the panel session, um, is the Committee for Gippsland, so much like Andy, have spent a lot of time in the Gippsland region um, and advocating for, for their interests and um, recently founded, along with um, some other women in the room, an organisation called Women of Offshore Wind, which has been quite a, um, an interesting experience and I think will only get more interesting as we go. Yeah, thanks, Erin. Uh, Ross? Thanks so much, Andy. Um, yeah, I'm Ross Rolfe. I'm the Chief Executive of... Uh, Iberdrola Australia, for those of you who uh, don't know of Iberdrola, it's one of the two largest energy utilities in the world that uh, began the journey of transition out of a fossil fuel past into a renewables future in Europe nearly 20 years ago or so now. Um, prior to uh, <coughs> Iberdrola acquiring uh, the company that I currently uh, work for, we were known as Infogen Energy. We were also a sort of pioneer in the renewables uh, sector in Australia, established around 2005, <clears throat> that sort of era. We uh, commenced to transition ourselves out of a conventional pure play uh, uh, renewables uh, model into the supplier of a firm to green energy product to commercial industrial customers in around 2016, 2017. So since then, we've been really uh, trying to focus heavily on how you manage intermittency risk in supplying a very high quality green product directly to customers. And we do that really by a combination of technologies um, and spatial distribution. So that is uh, a combination of wind, uh, onshore wind in different parts of uh, the geography, uh, solar, together with batteries and, um, as a last resort, uh, the use of gas peaking plant. So one of the things which I guess interests us in particular around uh, offshore wind is, um, as Derek was saying, how that fits into a sort of portfolio of generation that uh, really enables you to supply customers on a reliable basis and uh, with limited reliance on storage or uh, our longer term firming capability. As far as uh, the business more broadly is concerned, it is, uh, uh, it is sort of an energy ecosystem that is uh, designed to uh, meet the challenges of the transition. So apart from our onshore uh, and uh, hopefully soon to be offshore wind portfolio, uh, we also have a networks business and a, uh, a nascent green hydrogen business. So we sort of think about, um, I guess, the Australian energy system as a whole and uh, uh, what the opportunities uh, to meet our customer needs within it are. Thanks very much for that introduction. And I'd like to remind everyone in the audience that if you do have a question for any of our panelists, please uh, use the conference app and then uh, go into the live Q&A session to ask your question. Getting into the panel now, the Gippsland uh, feasibility license process, uh, it, the, I think, was 
April this year that, uh, that it was concluded and we're still waiting the results of this. But le what are some of the lessons that we as an industry can learn from Gippsland that we would like to see moving forward as we start to roll out more and more uh, zones in Australia? And maybe also along that line is as an industry, I think that we have been uh, very clear in asking government to come quickly to make sure that there is a, a, a steady cadence in the rollout of these projects. But are we moving too quickly? Do we need to actually be able to roll out a zone, stop, reflect, learn, and then move on? Or do we, is this pace what we want to see? Ross, if we start with you. Sure. Uh, thanks, Stuart. Um, well, I guess uh, a general comment first up. Uh, I think uh, the Gippsland post process actually was a, a pretty good effort uh, from a standing start by, um, by both levels of government. The information packages that were supplied, I think, did address key issues relating to, you know, key questions relate, uh, concerning port grid uh, access, uh, procurement processes for uh, the offtake and so on. I think the uh, offshore wind register Stra did a good job in terms of designing a, uh, a coordinated process. Both levels of government were particularly uh, proactive in engaging with industry and understanding the issues and so on. And I think one really inspired thing they did was to involve uh, uh, the information, sorry, the infrastructure, wind infrastructure uh, commissioner, Andrew Dyer, early in the piece because that meant there was a very heavy focus on what the issues for community are likely to be. In terms of um, <clears throat> moving uh, hastily, look, that's a, a delicate balance, uh, I think. I think you do want to pause uh, a bit and reflect on what could have been done better and maybe a couple of issues to comment on in that regard. Uh, I don't think um, probably anyone anticipated the uh, uh, amount of interest that there was going to be in East Gippsland, and so there was a sort of overwhelming impact on sort of local communities who probably um, weren't quite ready for the attention of 37 uh, applicants all wanting to meet them and explain themselves. So perhaps thinking about um, government leadership in that area is worth uh, consideration. Maybe the other thing that's worth consideration is um, what particular whole of area studies might be usefully conducted by government in advance, particularly around environmental baseline studies, geotech, and those, uh, those sorts of things. Yeah, I'd like to come back to that when we start talking about actually once we get awarded the licence, how do we then work together as an industry? Erin, I know you've been personally involved in a lot of this uh, the application for Gippsland. Yes, yes, along with the team. Um, so I think um, Ross is right, the framework itself is I think, you know, the standing side is interesting. What, what I've observed over the last few years is the Australian government across various departments and agencies deeply looking at what has worked overseas, what have the challenges and issues been, how do we structure a framework and legislation that uh, picks up on those lessons. So probably the key standouts for me, and I think it was um, Jens from RWE who mentioned this yesterday, is structuring that merit criteria uh, around the parties who are technically and financially capable of delivering these projects because offshore wind is not for the faint-hearted. Uh, it's, as Andy mentioned, it's, it's not an onshore solar project. This is a completely different proposition. Um, and when I look around the world where markets have sort of stopped and stalled, it, it can be due to perhaps the um, underestimation of the task ahead. So I think the fact that our decision makers are requiring that information of proponents and factoring that into um, the criteria and how that's structured and how we respond to those questions is, is a really good start. Um, I think there's, I mean, what I'd say is how can we improve for the next one? I think we've already seen it. Um, you know, the Hunter guidance has come out. There are some um, marginal changes to that, which I think are quite helpful in terms of clarification of 
um, exactly the questions that government's asking um, because we all want to do a really good job and put our best foot forward and um, sometimes we're maybe over delivering so personally I know the team's happy to see a page limit um, <laughs> this time so we can maybe just structure our thoughts a little bit. Um, so I think they're really marginal changes um, that, that are being made and I suppose once we go through a full, full round and, and see some decisions and outcomes that will be um, the point in which we can reflect more deeply and I think have that conversation with government around how we keep meeting those objectives um, that we're setting in our policy direction and as well as picking up on even some of the latest trends in these global markets. Derek? Yeah, really just echoing the same thoughts. Um, I think the saying is it takes a village, right? So for us, it's not just the, the federal process, state state processes, where's the, how we bring the local governments, communities along for the, along for the ride, indigenous communities. And I, I think you, you have to look at the Gippsland um, process so far and say it's, it's done really well. The Victorian government has, has been great. We, we always sort of looking for a little bit more. A number of the themes yesterday when we're talking about the APAC region still apply in Victoria. You know, we'd like to see the targets legislated in Victoria. We would like to see more around the support mechanism and both back to the comments that I made earlier and, and uh, Ross as well around that. How do you make sure that we've got a mechanism that gets that, that energy to, to the customer, right? How do we do corporate PPAs? How do we sell to retailers? How do we get to mums and dads offshore wind? Just got to think about this thing holistically. Uh, so there's, there's sort of some key points that we can go a little bit further. Again, that kind of the auction process, we just don't want to see a one-shot game. We want to see a clear timetable of future auctions, right? So, but again, you'd have to look at what's been done for Victoria and say, you know, Gippsland going really well. There, there's more to do. And then you expand that out to the other regions. And it's the same themes, right? There's a lot more to do in the other states. It's harder, like floating offshore wind is, is, is kind of next level of, of challenges. And Andy uh, mentioned that he's, he's at the start there that, you know, we've just got to be kind of realistic about our expectations. Uh, so for me, you know, Victoria, great job, um, more to do, but it's, it's, it's on the right path. Lining up those state and federal requirements, just making sure they line up, you know, how are we going forward with feasibility licenses being issued in New South Wales without clarity around what are the support mechanisms, how does that hold together? And again, where does the federal government get involved? Like we're seeing great work from the federal government in terms of supporting, uh, so New South Wales is an example, uh, they run a, a, a program, the uh, Alteza program, government, uh, the federal government stepped in and, and supported that. Uh, so where does offshore wind fit in those sorts of mechanisms? So great in Victoria, a uh, little more work to do there to, to keep up the, uh, I guess, the momentum and attract the, the OEMs, um, the supply chain, and then seeing the same things rolled out in the other states. That's it. Yeah, thanks, Derek. Jonathan? So I think looking at uh, Australia from outside and comparing it to other markets, I mean, what I quite like is there seems to be a lot of rational thought going on in the way these processes are defined. And I think well, one thing that you have to commend um, about this process, the feasibility licence process, is it's primarily qualitative. And, and I think that's important because at the end of the day, as some of the other panels have mentioned, I mean, th this is more than just about producing cheap electricity. This is about something quite strategic for the country, decarbonisation, job creation, energy independence, all these things. So it's really important you make good choices and choose developers who will help you deliver those strategic aims. And that's why I think a qualitative process works far better. I also like the fact that the process somehow gives a bit of credit to the parties who've been here for a few years really helping get the industry up and running. And then eventually, you know, it gets passed back to developers to see if they can sort out a problem for themselves before it becomes a, a quantitative exercise. So I think it, it's, it's a, a good process to get up and running and to kind of pay respect to all the work that had been done in the industry beforehand. I'd, I'd say um, in terms of lessons learned or things to think about for the future, I think, you know, that if, if this is a qualitative exercise primarily determined on merit, the merit criteria could be far clearer. Um, and I think in future, one of the lessons learned or one of the things that ought to be done is a review and a consultation about how that whole merit process worked. I think it's an unenviable task looking at these 37 or whatever it is applications. And if they're all as voluminous as ours, then it's quite a lot of material that they'll have to go through to do that. Um, th the second thing is that if you take this to its logical conclusion, what will eventually start to happen is everyone will start maxing out on merit 
because the industry will converge around those meritorious developers, and then we end up to a quantitative process. And I think at that point, it's quite important then to know what the actual market looks like and what the route to market mechanisms look like so that you can quantify the proposition and actually go into that quantitative process in an informed way. But again, that's something to come for future. And th what I would expect and suggest is that we get through this first process, spend a bit of time reviewing it and consulting on it, and then go back the, for future processes, taking account of those lessons learned and not kind of you know, rush process after process <coughs> before we've had the chance to, 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 to undertake that review. Just following up before we move on to Rafa, um, the merit criteria, can you, what market do you think Australia should draw inspiration from in, in is there any uh, um, markets where you think that, oh, we should look to this market and try to adopt something similar in Australia? Well, I mean, I think probably the best example outside of Australia in recent years is the Scotland process in the UK, which was a highly qualitative process. Um, and, you know, I, I think a lot of the industry appreciated that, that outcome. I mean, what's funny about the Scotland process is in the end, they awarded about 25 gigawatts and practically everyone that bid got a site. You know, so it, it wasn't so, <laughs> well, it wasn't so, um, it wasn't so, no, no, Shell, Shell did do very well uh, in partnership with Iberdrola, so that, that's, <laughs> but you know, but, but the fact is that it was at a time when other mature markets were going quantitative and seeing eye-watering prices being pushed into the system, imposing cost on the system, the Scotland process stayed very qualitative in a very well-structured process where it was very clear where the points would be earned, et cetera. And I think that was a good example, actually. Sorry, just That's jumping in good. on the Netherlands as well. So they got a good process around that. So again, it's that avoidance of financial shootouts at the end of the day where large amounts of money are paid for the equivalent of our financial licence that ultimately, back to consumers and getting a, an efficient outcome, just be really conscious of you know, what that literally drives. So. Yeah. Raphael, sorry. Yeah, I mean, before going into, you know, into your question, I'm just building on what uh, Jonathan said. I mean, I do agree with him that, you know, Scotland was, uh, you know, was, I would say, best practice on that. But if I have to choose, you know, a reference in which to look at how qualitative criteria are defined in a way that are, A, easy for the developer to try to, you know, to obtain the maximum scoring. And also, we did something that is important and I do believe that it's something that we are lacking here is how are they going to be assessed? Because to be honest, you, I mean, we have some doubts on how are they going to be assessed. It is true, but it's not, it's not pretty clear, no? So I think that one of the market, which I think is leading the way on that, although they may change things in the, in the next processes, is the Netherlands. I mean, the Netherlands, I mean, we're in the forefront of, uh, you know, of qualitative processes since, uh, I think, since Borsele 3-4. And they draft, uh, I mean, they took a lot of time in drafting the way that they are going to measure and clarify very well what they are going to take into account and what they are not going to take into account. So they do it in a way that, as I said, it's clear for you what you need to deliver to meet those criteria. And also it's clear what is going to be scored and what is not going to be scored, which is important because in a process like this one, as Jonathan said, I mean, which is a very positive thing. So it's linked with the comments at the beginning. I mean, one of the successes of this process is that we have 37 applications and all the usual suspects, all the good players have participated here. No? So it's very likely that, uh, you know, uh, without being, uh, you know, very pretentious, that all of us would have put forward good applications. No? So, but who is best and, you know, who are the best ones? How to assess that? How to make that comparison? No? So without having clear ways on how are they going to be assessed, that's one of the risks of qualitative processes, the risk of challenges, the risk of, uh, and why, why this one and not mine, or not my project, it's something that is, uh, that I think it could happen, no? and I think it's a lesson learned for, for the processes going forward, no? that linked on that. No? And then trying to avoid repeating what my, my, you know, my panel, my, my colleagues from the panel said, I think that linked with your point on, on, on timings, I mean, I, we do like the fact of having visibility on more processes to come, although, which is linked with my, the comment that I made, we would have appreciated having had the results precisely from Gippsland before Hunter, because I mean, we don't, I mean, as I said, I mean, there are some things which are vague, and we did our best in trying to interpret them, but we don't know whether we did it right or not, no? Yeah. And now we are preparing, imagine Hunter, without knowing whether we did it right or not, no? And we may, we may commit the same mistakes, no? So I think in terms of timings, it would have been good, you know, to wait to have the results from Gippsland, 
have like, uh, you know, lessons learned together with the industry, government, etc., which is something that I, you know, I do like here from Australia, having experience worldwide that here all the authorities at Commonwealth and at state level are very open to listen, which I think it's, you know, it's very good, but I would have rather have that, no? In order to benefit from the lessons learned and implement that in, yeah, in the right. hunter. Thanks, Francois. Uh, yeah, a lot has been said already, but I tend to agree with Raphael because what we have not uh, explicitly said that is in the end, what the government wants is that the party that is awarded or wins uh, this, this application will also build it eh? and, and will also build it as soon as possible. Uh, that's in the interest of the government in execution of its strategy, but that's also in the interest of the party winning it because he needs a stable framework to invest, yeah, what is still a lot of money, to, develop, to de develop these large infrastructure projects. And in that sense, of course, Scott did a great job in, 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 in structuring the bits and in making sure that you could submit what is a, a very transparent and, and, and a very concise bit. But what I also appreciate about the Netherlands and what Raphael said is that, at least in the Netherlands, when you're granted uh, the awards, you know that permitting-wise, a lot has been solved and that you can start investing your money in something that if you do your job properly, will be built. Depending, of course, on the market situation and some fluctuations in the market and supply chain that can impact things. But it's important as an investor, but also from a supply chain perspective, that not only the critical mass is there, and if we look forward and, and to the other regions next to Victoria, it will be key, and, and if you want to bring these closer to each other, to create a uh, system that is, I would say, easy to invest in. And the easier it is to invest, and the more certainty you have on your permitting uh, to invest going forward, the easier it will be to reach your timelines, the easier it will be to attract investors from outside of Australia, the easier it will be to attract supply chain, uh, internal and external, the easier it will be to sell a strong story to local communities, because you can engage with universities, you can engage with local stakeholders, because you have a real story with clear timelines and a clear momentum. Just to follow up on that, have you seen any market in the world that has come to market where as a, an emerging market or a new market where they actually have that in place to start with? Oh, if, if, if Europe one day used to be an emerging market as well, and uh, uh, I've been extremely lucky in building one of the first, or at least with the teams developing and building one of the first, I would say at that time, large offshore wind farms, because it was a 165 megawatt wind farm with the longest cable to be pulled uh, offshore 50 kilometers in sea with, I would say, infrastructure that was coming from oil and gas because we had no dedicated vessels for offshore winds. So a lot had to be designed in making sure that these investments could be done in, in, in a stable way. Uh, so was it designed the way the Netherlands were designed today or was it designed the way Scotland is looking into it? No. But at least... Uh, there was a clear, I would say, mandate given by the government and a clear ambition expressed by the government like, you know, we know this is going to be challenging, we know it's a new market and a new industry, but we as a government, we will make sure that permitting-wise, it will be easy and, and to invest in this, and we will make sure that we together identify what is the best strategy to also develop a local supply chain. And just to give you some numbers in Belgium, which is a very small market compared to Australia, but in Belgium, offshore wind represents 16,000 jobs today, which is a lot. And not only in operations and maintenance, because a lot of people focus on operations and maintenance being the long-term jobs, because once you build these things, you will operate them for 20, 25, 30 years, which, is these, which, which, which are long-term jobs in, in the maintenance, but also in your supply chain, if you identify it well, and, and, and can, you can create a lot of jobs by, by creating an internal market in, in, in supporting the development, construction and maintenance of these, these wind farms. Stuart, maybe just to say one more thing about the timing, I think from that big picture perspective, it's something like 80 months until 2030. So if we look at Australia, we have set the ambition to be 82% renewable by 2030. If we're gonna meet those targets, 
we, we actually need to move quite quickly. And I think government, and particularly Minister Bowen, has set industry the challenge. OK, we're going to be ambitious. You need to be ambitious as well. And it was one of the things reflecting from what Henry, Henrik Stisdale's presentation spoke to yesterday. Throw us the challenge and we will innovate with you. So um, I fully agree with Francois and the, um, we need to make sure these areas are screened from a due diligence perspective, particularly given we have separate environmental approval legislation that sits outside the Offshore Electricity Infrastructure Act. That, that for me, is probably the biggest risk. We just want to make sure those areas are going to be developable, um, that proper planning has been done. But in terms of the capacity of the private sector to deliver, I think we actually have an obligation to um, Australians and, frankly, the world to, to match that um, time frame that they're setting. Yeah, there's been a couple of questions coming in around the environmental aspect, so I'll, I'll get onto those in a sec. Um, but one of the, the another question that uh, has come in that I think mo uh, is on most people's lips is that uh, there's no federal target set for Australia, and there's no state target set for New South Wales. Victoria's um, got their targets. As an industry, and this is I'll, I'll throw this open to all of the panel. Uh, as an industry, what do we look for? What signals do we look for apart from targets that actually give us this business case certainty of investment? I mean, if I may, you know, surely I was going to make that point before, but one of the things that that I would say, at least for us, which make things easier in our investment committee, committee is precisely what Victoria did, no? Because it is true that the process was run by the Commonwealth, because, I mean, we are speaking about CBET exclusivity. I mean, in our business, this is just the first part. I mean, we need, as you mentioned, we need permitting, we need interconnection, and we need remuneration, no? So just the first step. No, but what Victoria did well is that although we didn't have full clarity on what is going to happen after, A, they, they acknowledge what is required because with the implementation statements, they acknowledge that we will need to have a route to market and they introduce the, that they are working on the CFD. They, they acknowledge that we will need infrastructure, so they have works on ports. They acknowledge that we will need interconnection. No? So having that, you know, that full scope of understanding from Victoria that having the CBET exclusivity, the feasibility license here, it's just the first step and that we would need, you know, that we would require something else to make the project happen. I think that's something that uh, was very helpful, not only the, you know, not only the target itself, no, but the acknowledgement by Victoria that they will need to do their homework to make the project happen. No? So it's not only having the CBIT exclusivity and that's it, no? So we need to have that, no? And by the moment in which we put the bid, having that certainty that Victoria acknowledges what is required and also that they are working on that, it makes things very, at least easier to us. But I think the Victorian implementation statements and the, and the, yeah. the, the like they're actually coming out as they actually said, I think that actually provides some certainty. But I mean, there's a lot of other zones that I'm not sure if that exists yet. I don't know if there's other areas. I mean, in particular, the, there was uh, Mark Davies question was around, there's no CFD for New South Wales. So what's the route to market for, for these projects? Maybe if I can reflect, I'd say two to three years ago, there was no visibility on that in Victoria either. Okay. And so I think this is, um, again, I said at the start, not a game for the faint-hearted. If you want all of the certainty before you have to start deploying capital, that's probably maybe choose another industry that's more stable. Um, <laughs> um, I say that with the greatest of affection for the offshore wind industry. Um, but but it, is, it is risky and it's high pressure. And so I think we need to... Um, see that sort of leap of faith and, and, you know, it was one of the things we did early on, Andy spoke about this in the opening, but um, the conditions didn't look very promising for offshore wind investment, even when CIP entered the market in 2017, we didn't have any kind of policy and, uh, but we could see the need. And so I think if, if we truly believe the need is there, we as the private sector need to show some faith and, and uh, participate in these processes without that clarity. Obviously, there are gates for investment and having those certainty indicators is critically important. Um, but I think there's a role and an element of, of how can we sort of um, risk share on some of those, those aspects and continue that dialogue with government. Yeah. Jonathan? Yeah, so I, I think I completely agree with, with Erin. I think you know, most developers coming into a market here will look at the fundamentals of the market and the long-term outlook and be able to judge for themselves whether it's a viable proposition and what, if any, support might be needed and whether the system is likely to be able to sustain that support. And that's one of the reasons why in Victoria it makes a lot of sense that that's the first mover, because it's much easier to see those fundamentals. I think the implementation statements in Victoria are, are absolutely um, you know, 
best in class. And I think that that's really important, again, because any experienced developer will see a target, but you immediately look behind the target to say, right, well, where's the ports? Where's the grid? What's the planning mechanism? I mean, the, you know, the, the golfing expression, driving is for show, putting is for dough. So I think in our industry, it's, you know, targets are for show, but grid is for dough. So, so what is it that's happening in Victoria to make that target reality? And you see that in the implementation statements. And to the extent to which other states haven't done that yet, they probably should, because that's how they're going to be able to keep pace with Victoria. Yep, Derek? Yeah, look, uh, just that comment about where does the federal government sit in, and, and the federal government has done great work in, in creating the, uh, I guess, the, the framework that we're all working under. Yes, there's, there's room for improvement in that space, but that's great. Uh, practically, it's, you know, if I was sitting there as the Victorian government, and uh, you know, talking about the first auction process and talking about targets, I would be looking to the federal government to see if there's additional support. Like clearly, um, so we talked about the um, capacity incentive scheme. So what the, the federal government has done there is looked at what's happening with the New South Wales program and put funds behind that themselves to, I guess, accelerate the program there. So there's a potential opportunity in Victoria for that additional step, the, the further auction, auction processes the setting of targets, the, the additional clarity that we're looking for to really get the excitement of the OEMs, there's potentially a role for the federal government there. Yeah, actually, that's what I wanted to touch on about the OEMs. I mean, now we've got, if, without the targets in Australia, and there's lots of targets in other countries in or other markets in APAC, I mean, that's a clear investment signal for the OEMs that they know that this volume is going to come over these years within this time frame, and so we can easily look to invest here. In Australia, are you at all concerned that when it comes time to build, there's going to be no components in which to build them from because the capacity is taken up by uh, other countries with ambitious and big targets? Are you, Ross? Uh, I, don't, I don't know that um, that's a current anxiety we have, but I do agree that to the extent that you can give visibility and confidence to OEMs about the future pipeline, that's really helpful. Um, particularly in terms of growing the industry as a whole. As an energy supplier, it's probably not worrying us hugely because we source from onshore, offshore and uh, so on. And actually, we probably expect the Altesa framework in New South Wales to actually be customised to provide an appropriate form of support to underpin the growth of the industry and its investability. I think it is really in, in terms of the supply chain that it's most helpful because it does offer sure. a lot of confidence. Uh, Francois? Yeah, m m maybe uh, in an addition to that, as, as, as you rightfully said, there is a lot of capacity that is going to be built in, in Europe uh, in, in the upcoming years. And what you see today is that companies or investors or uh, developers are securing supply chain three to five years in advance. Uh, being it vessels, being it turbines, name it. So it's, it's for sure important, uh, as I said in the beginning, to create that critical mass, uh, to have enough ambition uh, to bring, uh, to make the market appealing to, to that supply chain, to invest further and develop uh, a proper supply chain for Australia as well. And, and there it is indeed also good to see that uh, countries like, like New Zealand, for example, is, is basically uh, doing this kind of process, uh, uh, following Australia in doing so, which is, even though being at the smaller markets, uh, will certainly help in creating that critical mass. And also looking at, at other regions in Australia and the next steps there and the, the additional gigawatts to be allocated, it will be key to make sure that, you know, there is kind of continuity uh, in, 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 build, in developing and building going forward for the next decades so that that supply chain sees that investing uh, in, in a local supply chain is not just, you know, for that one or two or three projects, which are nice, which are big to be developed and built, but that it is something that is recurring and it is really part of the strategy in, in decarbonisation uh, of the Australian government. Yeah. So I think Jonathan first and then Derek. Yeah, so I mean, I think that, that question, I mean, there's two ways to look at it. But one is on localization, the extent to which you want to localize the supply chain. And I think nowadays, in particular, but probably should always have been like this, when, when the supply chain are looking at a localization 
opportunity or requirement. I mean, they're looking at two things, the throughput volumes that you get in that market. So does it, how many units per year is that factory going to be required to produce and does it justify the investment? And what's the price point? And nowadays, the supply chain are extremely hot on what's the price point because they've been caught in certain markets where the price point just doesn't support the supply chain and they are losing money in an unsustainable fashion. So I think um, if you want to localise, you've got to get those things right. Even if you're not localising, though, I think you have to take account of the fact that the offshore wind is going through a, a massive upturn in deployment and the supply chain is completely um, um, under-supplied right now and has to, to ramp up. And lead times are pushing out, which actually makes that whole CFD question quite an important one, the timing of that CFD question. And you have to get the right balance. In, from On the one hand, the CFD has to come late enough in the process that you can actually fix a price that makes sense. But it needs to come early enough in the process that the developer then has the confidence to start attracting the supply chain and reserving slots and taking account of long lead items. And that's why that's a really important thing for Victoria to get you know, visibility out there on um, as soon as possible. Because the next stage of this will immediately um, re require that information in the hands of developers. And maybe just to build on that, Jonathan, I think you're absolutely right, the timing of that, because the supply chain um, is having those challenges and we're seeing that stop start in other markets. And I think that's why, um, you know, designs such as in Ireland, where you've got uh, price adjustments for commodity prices between the um, time of executing an agreement to the point of financial close on a project is really smart because government doesn't lose the gigawatts that it's counting on um, and developers can go forward and the supply chain can go forward with their orders. So it just takes a lot of heat and uh, pressure out of that if we can design the scheme in a way that accounts for those potential headwinds that might come down the track. You're right, because actually, if you don't do that at the moment, then it has to be priced in up front and you end up paying for it at the top of the market. Yeah. Uh, we have, let's crystal ball a little bit now. Uh, so say that there is, for example, for argument's sake, six feasibility licenses uh, awarded in Gippsland and you're all, <laughs> well, maybe, <laughs> five, <laughs> maybe, maybe five and it's, uh... <laughs> Is this going to be the Hunger Games, Stuart? <laughs> <laughs> so, so maybe there's, we've got six feasibility licenses in Gippsland and there's some questions here around um, how does, the industry collaborate on some of the common works that needs to be done. So, for example, like you know, how, we don't want to do six so, so geo surveys of the same area, etc. How do we actually work together as an industry, and what's the appetite for doing that from the people on the panel? Derek, you can. Yeah, see. look, I, I can make a start and then and hand off to the other panelists. I, I do think there's there's some there's some easy things to do, like as Shell. Uh, so it's sort of working in the community as well, right? How do we show up to the community? How do we not confuse the community? How do we bring everyone along for the along for the ride? So Shell's got a lot of experience. We sort of deal with about a dozen or so communities across Australia at the moment, and really how we show up together. It's like some of those ideas around having the kind of like a, a, a hub, right? So rather than each of us setting up an office in an area, having our local representative that people can go to talk to. We could set up a hub, right? We could get together, have the one location. We can each have our own stands or however we want to structure it. But some of it is those, just those little things about how we interact with the community and we're seen to be working together and being collaborative. I mean, it's always challenging. And as, as Shell, we've got some, uh, you know, we look at Curtis Island as an example with the LNG facilities, you know, three competing organisations developing multiple infrastructure across the same area, right? There are definitely some paths to go down that can cost everyone far too much money, right? So we do have examples in Australia where things have gone wrong, the things we can learn from, um, but certainly as showing up to the community as, as a, I guess, a, a single industry uh, is, is one of those steps, I think. Yeah. Raphael and Jonathan. No, I mean, I just echoing what, what my colleague said. I mean, it's something we have a common interest and in. I mean, there are, we have, Examples precisely. I mean, working in, for instance, in Korea. I mean, working with Selec in other projects. We share. We are in common areas, and we are working together because I mean, we have the same goal. We want the project to be delivered, and also we are dealing with the same stakeholders. So, I mean, we want to be seen. It's something that I think that in Europe we are managing to do th to do that, and when Europe is doing a good job, that I mean, we are seen as the offshore wind industry. I mean, we are not uh, Iberdola. We are not uh, Ocean Winds. We are not Corio. It's the offshore wind industry. You know? So I think that. Uh, 
I mean, if, if we are likely that we are that we are awarded, I mean, we will work together to make it happen. No, when when tackling the stakeholders, when tackling everything, I mean, it would be good to be seen as the industry as a whole rather than you know that individual company. So I think it's something that would be, you know, for the benefit not only for us but also for the benefit for you know for the deploying the deployment of the projects, no? which is what we all want. Jonathan. Yeah, so I think that there's a, probably a, a sort of hierarchy of things that you can work your way through here, and there's good precedent from Europe and other markets of doing this. There are certain things which are just enablers in the industry that it makes no sense not to collaborate on. Things like health and safety, actually. You know, the, the Global Offshore Wind Health and Safety Organisation is a really good body just to get that collaborative vibe going. Things like skills and education and training, again, we all need a skilled workforce and it makes sense that we work together to do the, the, you know, the gap analysis and then work with institutions to, to plug that. Then you come down to things that are like enabling infrastructure like ports and grid and things that we'll all benefit from somehow so it makes sense we do it together. And then you get down to things where there are more specific to projects, but there's more synergies or economies of scale if you work together. And by the time you get to that stage, it's easier to find the collaboration if the mechanism that sets the market doesn't put developers in a cutthroat competition against each other. So market mechanisms really help drive the right collaborative behaviour. So you work your way down the hierarchy, there's things that must happen and should happen anyway, and other things that will depend a bit on how the market is constructed and how you know, competitive and at what stage you compete. Another good reason to go early with a CFD is once everyone's got the CFD in hand, it's much easier to collaborate because you're not, you know, kind of holding a bit back for when the CFD competition comes, for example. Sure. Yeah, uh, Aaron, 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 I'd like to come to you last on this, but Ross, you wanted to come in here um, as well. Look, I think that was so eloquently put there by Jonathan. It's hard to add um, to it, but maybe a couple of thoughts. Um, certainly, in our consultation in the Gippsland community, there was a very strong uh, body of support wanting the industry to collaborate uh, on many, many fronts, not the least of which is how to sort of leave a legacy in the area that reflects the industry as a whole rather than individual developers. At another level, it was around environmental protection and planning at a regional level. Um, at another level, it uh, concerns how to work with government in uh, promoting uh, the evolution of uh, local industry into the supply chain. So to me, it's um, rich with possibilities. Yeah, and Erin, I mean, you guys have done so much work in, in these areas and consultations in these areas, and now we've got a lot of other interest in there. So you have an, also an interesting challenge there. Yeah, I think um, firstly to fully endorse everything that Jonathan and, J and Ross just mentioned, and I think it's our responsibility as developers to those communities. Um, what is it that they're looking for from this industry? Let's deeply understand that and then let's work together on those elements. So naturally, there, we're in a current competitive environment. There's, there's certain things that once we get past those those um, milestones, there'll, there'll be much more. But I think right now, if we're looking for practical examples, it's the thing that I hear the most. It's about the jobs, the training, the skills. Um, and that's where I think we've done quite a lot of work, not just as an offshore wind industry, but with the existing employers in the region. And I'm really um, pleased when we've created artefacts like our jobs guide, our worker guide. Um, there is a trilogy, so later this week down in Gippsland we will be um, releasing our supplier showcase, which um, at the back of that document has about 30 organisations listed that contributed to it, hundreds of hours of work. Um, so talking to the AGLs, the Energy Australias, um, where, where is your workforce at now? What are they looking for? What skills do they have? Um, what suppliers are you using from this local region that are going to need supply opportunities in future? But not just within industry, but local government. And I know there's there's local government people here in the room. Um, Gunnar Kernai, for us traditional owners, what, what are those aspirations? Um, and a lot of those economic development agencies. So I think when we talk about collaboration, there's a point of collaboration within our own little world of offshore wind that we're very obsessed with. Um, but sometimes we have to go and lift our eyes up and go, actually, what's happening in these areas? And fishing, you know, these, these uh, some of the most enthusiastic conversations I have are with local fishing vessel owners out there, and they're loving going out and looking for whales and birds and all of those sorts of things. So the more that we can understand those existing areas and communities that we're working in and then collaborate with those parties to get the outcomes, um, the, the greater industry that we'll create here. Francois? 
yeah, you see a also in Europe more and more a clear role for the federations uh, in working together. I'm also the president of the Federate Offshore Wind Federation in Belgium, uh, where you see that in the end, and there I follow, uh, one of the tricky moments is always that CFD award, huh? because uh, you want to work together, but in the end still a bit of competitive to each other in, in making sure you awarded a CFD. Uh, but we need also to prepare and think long term and, and see where the common quick wins eh, can be found because that's good for, 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 for all of, of, of the stakeholders within Australia is that people in these areas, and especially uh, they've been mentioned by my colleagues, in these areas like education, health and safety, uh, but also in, in setting up some local supply chain, it makes sense to create enough volume in, un, in supporting these new industries, these new uh, SMEs to be set up uh, in working together. And, and, and I think it's one of the things that maybe uh, from a federation point of view, it can also be supported. Thank you very much. Well, we have reached the, uh, the end of our session. Uh, could you please thank the panelists for their time? And uh, I've had a fascinating conversation, so thank you very much, everyone. So please make them feel, well, please welcome them all. Thank you.